thank you, Father Matt, and thank you to all of you. What an honor it is to be here to deliver this lecture uh, in, in memory of this great man, Father Murray. Um, and to do so, uh, to represent the ideas of America Magazine, what an honor that is for me. Uh, to speak before you and to see Father Matt, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for the last few years, to talk about the ideas of civility that we try to see, that we do in fact experience when we read that great magazine, but which we see too little of in American discourse today. That's what I want to talk about. How can we think differently about the idea of civility? Now, I'll start by giving you a pretty famous quote of Father Murray himself, uh, who thought differently about most issues of the day. On this very issue of disagreement, Father Murray once said that most of what is called disagreement is simply confusion. I wonder if that's true. That's what I want to think about. Now, it's funny, when, when I, my, my day job, uh, I, I run a think tank. I run the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, DC. Uh, we have 280 dedicated professionals working on public policy issues, everything from economics to education to health the national security and everything in between, talking to politicians. And one of the things that I've learned over the past 10 years as president of a think tank is that when you have intractable problems, you don't solve them by thinking harder in the conventional way. I mean, many of you are very successful in business or whatever you do for a living. And you know that when you have a big problem, if you want to solve it, don't think harder in the old way. You need an epiphany. You need to think in a new way. You need a breakthrough. That's what we try to do in my institution. That's what we try to do when we have a big problem. And this is a big problem, civility in public life today. By the way, this idea of epiphanies, it's not just about work. You've experienced it in your lives. I have many times. I was, my wife was, was, my wife Esther reminded me of this one instance of this. Um, we were just recently, you know, our, our second son graduated from high school uh, in, in June, by the grace of God. <laughs> and uh, in the run up to that, we were having, in the year before, we were having this terrible parent teacher conference. It was going wrong. And it was just, I mean, as going s south as fast as you could. And it was a grades problem. You know, some of you have had teenagers. <laughs> And, and you know what this feels like. He's not living up to his potential. We don't know if he's going to graduate. And uh, <clears throat> we were very stressed out. And we, and, and we got in the car, and we were driving home, and I was driving, and it was sort of silent. And my wife, you know, she's from Barcelona. She's uh, an optimist. <laughs> and she says, we need to think about this old problem in a completely new way. And I said, I'm all ears, sweetheart. Because <laughs> I've had it. She said, at least we know he's not cheating. <laughs> so how do we think differently, in that spirit, of, about the civility problem? Look, I don't have to give you the data on the polarization in America. I don't have to give you the evidence that we're more polarized ideologically in this country than at any time since the American Civil War. You've seen it ad absurdum. If you don't believe it, go on social media and be prepared to become depressed about it. My job tonight is to help you and me think about the problem in a different way such that we might have a fighting chance at a solution. Now, to begin with, I gotta change the name of my talk because I think civility is garbage. Why? Well, if you tell somebody, <clears throat> well, you know, my workplace is civil. It's like, how's your job search going? <laughs> Similarly, if you say, you know, say, how's your marriage? We tolerate each other, <laughs> right? Good luck. Civility and tolerance are very low standards for us to live together, to govern together, to be successful together. We need to live up to a higher standard. We need to live up to a Catholic standard, which is love. So here's the first thing that I want to do in the spirit of of Father John Courtney Murray. I want to change the terms of the debate on how we can restore love to national discourse. And I believe that the way to do it, to think, we have to think in a new way about two problems that I'm gonna offer up to you with respect and love. Number one is what I think the biggest public problem we face in America today that we can solve together, if we think different. And the second is, I'm gonna get a little bit more controversial, how we can look at politics 
in a different way. So let's start with policy. You know, when you think about what are our policy problems today, you say, well, you have deficit, you know, deficits and debt and you know, taxes and national security, and you get into all the nitty gritty. That's what we do all day in my think tank. <clears throat> But I believe that the biggest problem that we face today that lies behind a lot of our polarization, a lot of behind the bitterness and the lack of love, is the way that we treat people at the margins of our society. And there are people at the margins of society that are sympathetic to us and to whom we're sympathetic, and those not so much. But the fact is, I believe, that we treat people at the margins incorrectly, and this lies at the basis of our antipathy toward each other. Coming together to help people at the margins of society is the basis of our unity. And we need to think differently about that. By the way, Pope Francis talks about this constantly. Do you want to love each other? What does he tell you to focus on? La gente a la periferia de la sociedad. That means the people at the periphery of society. Why does he say that? Now, I'm thinking, I was thinking about that. I was thinking, why does Pope Francis always exhort us to think about the poor so that we can love each other? Weird, isn't it? And then I remembered something that I heard from a friend of mine who's a friend of some of yours too, Bishop Robert Barron. He was talking to me one time about a, his great mentor, Cardinal Francis George. Cardinal George in Chicago was controversial sometimes, but he was pretty unambiguously the great brain of the American Catholic Church for years. His ideas really were, were dominant. And he was also, by the way, a prodigious fundraiser. He was known for being able to get money from anybody for anything in Chicago. So if Cardinal George was on the phone, woe be unto you. <laughs> and, and, and Bob Barron reminded me <laughs> one time of a, a, a famous fundraising pitch that Cardinal George was making in Chicago. Um, it was, he was on the North Shore where the rich people live and he was talking to these really wealthy people convincing them that they should just fork over millions of dollars to pay for Catholic relief service programs on the south side of Chicago for the poor they'd never seen and never met and probably never would. And here was his argument. Cardinal George said this. You, the poor... They need you to pull them out of poverty. And you need the poor to keep you out of hell. <laughs> you know, that's fundraising, man. I mean, it's like, it's gutsy move, your eminence. I mean, it's, um, I'm not going to use that for AEI, by the way. But, but, but that's what Pope Francis means. <laughs> That's the reason that the, the people at the periphery of society, if we understand what we're supposed to do, the way that we treat them, whether they're sympathetic to us or not, holds the solution for us to have greater unity as people. How? How do we need to think about it differently? Because you know what? I'll tell you. I've been studying poverty my whole career. I'm an economist. Don't hold that against me. <laughs> and you know... You know, I've been looking at poverty programs going back decade after decade after decade, and we, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, this is not success. You know, it's funny, you, you it's, it's not funny, it's sad. You know, you go back to the, the beginning of the American War on Poverty, so incredibly well-intentioned. 1964, April 24th, as a matter of fact, that was the day that, that Lyndon Johnson went to Inez, Kentucky, in eastern in eastern Kentucky, Martin County, the heart of coal country. He went there that day, and there's famous pictures of this, because he went with a bunch of photographers from Life Magazine, because he was the master of the press. I mean, people talk about Trump and Obama, huh? -uh. LBJ, he was the master. And he goes there with these writers from Time Magazine, these photographers from Life Magazine, because he was gonna kick off his great war on poverty. And the way he did it, he went to this little town that had been left behind. It was, it was the developing world in America. Most people didn't know this. Some of you maybe remember. And he found a random guy. This is brilliant. He found a random guy and walked up on this guy's porch. His name was Tom Fletcher. You can see this. You Google this. this Tom Fletcher is this little guy, a little wiry guy. And, and, and LBJ is huge. And so he has to get down on his haunches next to Tom Fletcher. And he says, tell me your story. You know, everybody's taking notes. And Tom Fletcher tells him the story of Woe. He's a, in a first grade education. He was illiterate. He had eight kids. He was 38 years old. They were malnourished. He hadn't had a job in years. He had no hope 
with no future. And, and, Tom, and, and LBJ gets up from Tom Fletcher, Fletcher's porch and walks off. He says, today I declare a war on poverty. And our goal is total victory. And you would have cheered. Maybe some of you did. I agree with every word. He comes back to Washington. And he puts a general in charge of the war on poverty. A man named Sergeant Shriver. Is Eunice Kennedy Shriver's husband. Uh, it was uh, JFK's brother-in-law. This is a great American. This is a great Catholic American. As a matter of fact, I met him once, right before he died, because he was in my parish in Bethesda. His son is my next-door neighbor in Bethesda. That's a Washington thing. <laughs> you know, and, and Sergeant Shriver, Sergeant Shriver, great, he's a hero, actually. He... Um, he was asked, what's the objective of the war on poverty? And here's what he said. I don't care what your politics are. You're going to agree with this. Dignity, not doles. Hmm. I agree with that. You agree with that. We all agree with that. So how has it turned out? We spent $23 trillion in the war on poverty. And since the time that the war on poverty programs were established, we've gone from 14% of the country in poverty to 13% of the country in poverty. That's failure in any industry besides government. And it's not right. It's not right, not because of the $23 trillion. It's not right because we haven't succeeded. We've made poverty easier to bear, but not easier to escape. And that has failed Sergeant Shriver's test of dignity, not doles. Okay, now... Identifying the problem. This is the problem with the way that our society deals with the people at the peripheries, the Pope says, at the margins, as we like to say. Maybe the needs are something different. What is the war on poverty? What is it intended to do? It's intended to help poor people. I got it. I'm a Christian. I want to help people. But that's not what people need. People need not to be helped. People need to be needed. Remember Cardinal George? <laughs> you need the poor. Do you? You live in New York City. Most of you do. I live in Washington, D.C. This is one of the richest places in the United States. If all of the poor people in our communities suddenly disappeared, how long would it take you to know that? I mean, really know that. Socially, emotionally, morally. Long time. Too long, I dare say. And that's historically anomalous. You know, this country was built by poor people. You know, I, I look around this room. You know, there are 150 of you here. And that's 150 stories. You know, and they're all different. You know, some were, you know, the, the Malones were scratching out potatoes in Ireland three generations ago. Or... You know, and, and, and you know, in my workplace, most of the, my colleagues were running from a shtetl in Central Europe, running for their lives. And, and, and a lot of Americans were brought here involuntarily. But let me tell you what we all have in common. We descend from ambitious riffraff. And we're proud of it. This is the reason that we're the solution to what the world needs. Because it's a world of riffraff. And we're a country built on riffraff. None of you, none of your families came here landed gentry, you know. No handouts for them. They built this country. It's funny, you know, I, I, just, I used that turn of phrase um, a couple of months ago. And, and afterward, you know, some guy puts up his hand and I call him and, 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 and he says, I just want you to know that I, I resent the way you characterize my ancestors. <laughs> oh my God, brother. He says, they were not ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened? What happened? We went from needing poor people to simply helping poor people. We went from looking at all people as assets to develop in our nation to seeing some of them as liabilities to manage. And that's a moral error. Now, how do we solve that error? How do we solve that? It's, it's, it's weird, you know, in my work, my day-to-day -day work, you know, I'm a or, you know, an academic, and so I do a lot of academic kind of work with my colleagues. But, but let me tell you how I really get my ideas. I go, and you remember when, when Pope Francis was in 2013 in his wonderful tour of the United States, and he was, he was giving a homily in, in Washington, D.C. at St. Matthew's Cathedral. And in the congregation were all the American bishops. 
But we all got to hear his wonderful, his beautiful homily. And here's the, the piece of advice he gave to his brother bishops. Maybe some of you remember it. The shepherd needs to smell like the sheep. And I thought, yeah, so true. It's so true. That's a problem with the bishops. They're too far away from the people. They're too bureaucratic. They don't smell like me, like a sheep. And then I thought, how sheep-like do I smell? Because, you know, I'm a bishop. I mean, I'm not a bishop in the church, but I have a leadership job. I run an institution. You're bishops. How sheep-like do you smell? Are you actually in touch with the people? And again, this is all of a piece. This argument is all of a piece. How far are you away from the people at the margins of society? Do you smell enough like the sheep? In my work, I do work on, I study poverty. And I realized when the Pope said that, that I don't really know any poor people. That's not right. <laughs> so I started, to, I started to, to, to get in touch with the most successful programs I could possibly find that had incredible success pulling people out of poverty so people could earn their success and fully participate in the free enterprise system. It's the goal. We all want that. <clears throat> One of them is the Doe Fund, which is a program called Ready, Willing, and Able here in New York City. On Fifth Avenue, you see those guys in blue jumpsuits sweeping the streets? That's actually, those guys are homeless. They belong to the Doe Fund, which was started when the founders met at St. Agnes Church by Grand Central Station. They were feeding the homeless at Grand Central. They said, what can we do that will actually help more? And they started this homeless shelter based on the sanctification of work because work brings meaning and work brings purpose. You know it's true. Work brings dignity. And I was talking to one of these guys in this program. It, it, it's, a, it's, a kind, it's a story that you hear a lot. You know, he's a, taking drugs in high school and crime and dysfunctional family and his dad wasn't around and... Anyway, long story short, he was involved in a, in a robbery and, and a convenience store clerk was killed when he was 18. He went to prison for life. By the grace of God and the New York penal system, he gets out at 40. So 22 years later, he gets paroled, goes into this program, starts to work sweeping the streets. After three months, gets a job in, a, in an exterminator agency killing bugs. And that's when I meet him. Where am I going with this? He's the one who helped me understand how we get dignity, how we move away from just help. What's the new way of thinking? I said, how's your life? And he pulled out his iPhone and he said, let me show you. <laughs> and he showed me an email from his boss. His name was Rick. He said, Rick, there's an emergency bed bug job on East 65th Street. I need you now. And I said, so what? He said, read it again. He says, I need you now. That is the first time in my life anybody has said those words to me. Need, not help. <laughs> Do you need People who are poorer than you? Do you need people in the margins of society? If the answer is no, you're doing it wrong. Okay, now, public policy. Here is the acid test for good public policy to which I will expose myself and judge myself for the rest of my life. Does this public policy make people at the margins less necessary or more necessary? More needed by the economy, more needed by their communities, more needed by their families, or less so? If it's less, it's bad. If it's more, we're actually bringing people to dignity. And together, remember, the Pope tells us that we can have greater unity, not just civility, love, and the common purpose of bringing people to greater dignity by needing that. That's idea number one. Now let's get more controversial with idea number two, because... If I were to ask you, what's the source of our incivility in America today, you'd say something about politics. And it's just ghastly. You know, I live in Washington, D.C., basically, so you don't have to. <laughs> you know, and it's just, you can't believe it. I mean, you can't believe how they talk to each other. You know, we were in the, in the 2016 presidential debates, you know, watching it with my, with my, with my, my, a couple of my kids. And I remember saying to my daughter, who was 14 at the time, I said, honey, don't, don't forget that you know, these people, I'm talking about presidential candidates, don't reflect our values. Think about that. That's just, it's depressing. Why? It wasn't because of particular policies. Bad or good, you decide. The problem was the way that they were talking to each other. Uncivil in the context or in the, in the vernacular that we, we probably, that we ordinarily hear. But the real problem is a, a lack of love for each other. So, how do we solve that? How do we solve that? 
you know, it is, at the time I was just, I was at wit's end. I don't know what to do, right? I mean, this is getting worse and worse and worse and worse, run up for the election. And I was, uh, here's, my, here's my epiphany came. The first one was, you know, thinking about Cardinal George and then my exterminator guy. <laughs> this one came when I was giving a speech. I, I do 175 speeches a year. That's what I do for a living. It's great. Totally beats work. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> and uh, I do lots of audiences. I do a lot of universities with very left-wing audiences at universities. I do activist organizations, sometimes liberal, sometimes really, really super conservative. I'll talk to anybody because it's a privilege to be able to do it. And um, <clears throat> I was in New Hampshire in the run-up during this period thinking about this. <laughs> I got to find a new way of thinking. And uh, I was giving a talk to a, 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 like a Tea Party activist group. Okay, like 700 conservative activists, but like three cornered hats, the whole deal. I mean, they were into it. And, and I was the only non presidential candidate. This was actually before the debate, so I was thinking about this already. Non presidential candidate on the, on the ticket. <clears throat> so it was, you know, people that were going to win, people who had no chance, but they were all politicians and me. And I was thinking, I was saying my prayers beforehand, actually, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to say? And I think the answer that I got was, try to make them better and try to be more helpful. Okay. So I get out there and it's like, you know, the, 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 the presidential candidates are just throwing stakes into the audience, right? And, and mostly, by the way, you know, I'm a, my most politics are center right. So I agree with the economic policies and things that they're talking about mostly. But... But it wasn't right the way that they were talking about people with whom they disagreed. And so I thought, this is my opportunity. So in the middle of my talk, I stopped and I said, I want everybody here, hundreds of people, I want all of you here to remember the people who are not with us today. And they're political progressives. And I want you to remember that they're not stupid, and they're not evil. Right? I mean, it's self-evident. This lady puts up her hand and she says, I think they're stupid and evil. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, yeah, of course, they, I mean, the audience laughed just like you did, and, 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 and it was fine. I didn't feel repudiated. I didn't, it wasn't, she wasn't insulting me at all. She was making a joke. It's all good. It's all good. But you know what I thought? Here's where the epiphany comes. Here's the flash, right? Here's what I thought. You know, I grew up in Seattle, Washington, in a liberal family, which is redundant. <laughs> and um, my father was a college professor and my mother was an artist. What do you think their politics were? <laughs> and when that lady said that, I thought, she's talking about my brother. She's talking about my family. And I remember this, you know, I remember when I was growing up learning that Christians have a moral responsibility to stand up to people on their own side, not just people on the other side. You have the strength to stand up on behalf of somebody with whom you disagree to somebody with whom you agree. Now think about it. It makes perfect sense. You know, get a bunch of yahoos with whom I agree politically saying my brother's an idiot. I care a lot more about the relationship with my brother. A lot more. And I have a moral responsibility to stick up for him. But beyond that, I have a moral responsibility to stick up for you. And I don't even know you. Because that's what we do. Remember, the goal is love, not just civility. Civility is to smile and take it. Love is to stand up to a bully. That was my flash at that moment. How can we, how can we do that better? How can we do that better? Now, a little social science for you. If you're going to express more love, if you're going to... If you're going to do what I'm talking about here, you have to understand the nature of the problem in American public discourse today. We often hear that the problem that we have is anger. There's too much anger in American politics, right? Everyone's angry with each other, right? That's actually wrong. There's nothing wrong with anger. Anger, uh, according to, I mean, I have a friend who, who's a, the, the, really the nation's leading expert in marital reconciliation. His name is John Gottman. He teaches at the Gottman. He has a Gottman, the Gottman Institute, the University of Washington, Seattle. And he has brought thousands of couples back together who are on their way to the divorce court. The guy's my hero. Anybody who brings couples together, brings more love, keeps the divorce down, my hero. The guy's great. And he told me that there's actually no statistical correlation between anger and separation and divorce in a relationship. Which is good being married to a Spaniard, I can assure you. <laughs> 
The problem isn't anger that leads to permanent enemies. That's not the problem. So, so what is it? He brings people together in the laboratory. He has this trick where you take a couple that's quarreling and he'll videotape them and then he'll watch the videotape with the sound turned down to zero and within five seconds, he can predict whether the couple will be divorced within five years with 97% accuracy by looking at it. <laughs> What's he looking for? Eye rolling. Eye rolling. What's eye rolling a sign of? Not of anger, of contempt. Take anger, mix in disgust. Disgust is the conviction of your worthlessness. And what do you get? You get contempt. Contempt is cold. When somebody treats you with contempt, Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, the great 19th century philosopher, defined contempt as the conviction of the worthlessness of another human being. That you don't forget. Anger you can get over. Contempt you don't. I wrote about this in the New York Times recently in the context of our horrible, growing scandal in the church. What's the existential crisis? It's the contempt of the laity. The love between the clergy and the laity is special, it's magical, it's cosmic, it's ordained by God. And just like a couple, when trust is gone, disgust enters, and it, it's when, when anger is unremediated because the other party simply won't acknowledge it, simply won't take it seriously, disgust enters, turns into contempt, and that's the loss of love, maybe permanently. That's the crisis we face in the church. It's a crisis not of anger. It's a crisis of contempt. By the way, toward the clergy, toward the hierarchy, God forbid, toward the church. And that's the same thing that we see across America. I mean, think about how people talk to each other in politics. It's unbelievable when I watch debates on the House floor, when I, when I, when I actually see what's going on on cable television, when I can stand it, when I look at social media, people treat each other with with unmitigated contempt. That's our problem. That's our problem. So how do you break it? Now, if you think about it, some of you are active, you have political discussions with others. And I bet, if you're thinking about it, how do you, how do you exhibit contempt? Mockery, sarcasm, disdain, eye rolling, right? I bet you know, you've heard yourself doing that. I bet you've said something that sounds like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. That's contempt, not anger. Right? That's a mistake. That does not exhibit love. That's beneath us as Catholics. It's beneath us as Americans. And it leads to permanent destruction. Don't get love. You can't get it. Forget civility. Okay. So here's the problem. It's not, it's not really your fault. You have a habit of doing that. We're in a habit of expressing ourselves that way. So how do you break a habit? There's a great deal of new brain science literature on breaking bad habits. The whole industry of that stuff, right? And, and you know, the, the, it basically builds around the, the, the fact that there's a part of your brain, a very ancient part of your brain called the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens trains you to do something that you like without actually using your prefrontal cortex, without using your conscious brain. It just reinforces itself. That's how habits get done. That's the reason that you, the phone rings and you light a cigarette if you're a smoker, for example. Habits are hard to break. The only way to break a habit is to retrain the nucleus accumbens, and the only way to do that is to put something else in the place of the bad habit. Okay? That's a little, your science lesson for the day. So, you have to do, and, and by the way, all of you have done that. When I, I, Father Matt mentioned that I was a, a classical musician for a long time. I was a professional French horn player in the Barcelona Symphony. And I, it, I, <laughs> I, I smoked cigarettes, and it was, I didn't want to, because it was, dirty and disgusting and it made my mother sad and, and it had to stop. But it's a habit. I had to put something else in place of it. So I started drinking. <laughs> okay. We have a contempt habit in America. We need to replace it with something else. What do you replace it with? Now I'm thinking about this. This is on a, on a trip. I was actually making a documentary film. And I was in Dharamsala, India, in the Himalayan foothills. I was, at the, I was at the monastery of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, somebody with whom I've, I've worked a great deal over the past six years. We've written together, we've, we've, we've made films together, we've done a lot of events together. It's a treasured friendship for me. And between takes, I said, I told him about this thing, I said, Your Holiness, what should I do when I feel contempt? I mean, he's got the answer for sure. And he says, practice warm-heartedness. That's your subject. 
And I thought, you got anything else? Because, you know, that sounds like sort of weak, like an aphorism. Then I thought about it. Some of you know a thing or two about the Dalai Lama. He's the head of the Tibetan Buddhist people. He was the leader of the Tibetan people until relatively recently. He's the, the 14th Dalai Lama. He was exiled from Red China uh, in the 1950s. He was kicked out through pure aggression of the Chinese. He was led into exile with a, a pacifistic, weak people numbering, uh, 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 numbering just a few tens of thousands, representing an entire Tibetan population in an enormous land mass of only six million in a country at that time that was almost a billion people. No shot, no contest. He went into exile to be gone and forgotten forever. And what has happened? In the last 60 years, he's become the most respected religious figure in the world. How? He starts, I asked him, he starts every day praying for the Chinese leaders. Not that they'll give him back his homeland, but they'll have a happy and a good life. Do you pray for your enemies? It's tough stuff. Here's the point. Contempt is for weak people. Warm heartedness is for strong people. Are you strong enough to see contempt and answer with warm heartedness? This is what he challenged me with. Of course, my, my question then was, well, how? How? And he said, this is great advice. I'm going to share it with you. He said, think of a time when you accidentally were treated, we were treated, treated with contempt and you accidentally answered it with warm heartedness. And then remember that every time. So I went back to my little room where I stay when I'm in Dharamsala with His Holiness. And I meditated and I prayed. And I remembered a time. And I want to share it with you. Because I want you to remember your time. Look, within the next 24 hours, you're going to be treated with contempt. Probably. And if you blow it, things get worse. And if you pass the test, things get better. So you need to go through this exercise too so you can remember a time and remember the feeling and change the culture. Okay, so what was my experience? And it was this. Before I came to the American Enterprise Institute, I was teaching at Syracuse. And I had the happiest life because being a professor is the best life in the world. I was beavering away in relative professorial obscurity, writing my books and my articles. It's great. I mean, I wrote books that nobody ever read because they were very boring, but that was okay. And then my life changed. In 2006, I wrote this book that was, by the way, very boring and very technical and very mathematical, but it hit the news cycle in just the right way. This happens to professors sometimes. Just a random professor gets scooped up by media. And my book started selling hundreds of copies a day. And I was on media every single day. I was on TV and I was on the radio every single day. And my life changed. Literally changed permanently, as a matter of fact. Now, here's the weird part. When my life changed, I started hearing from strangers. You never hear from strangers when you're a regular professor, but your email is very easy to get. And so I would get these emails by the dozens a day because people were reading my book. And when somebody reads your book, they think they know you and they give you intimate details of their lives because they're your, you're their friend or their enemy. Like, I loved your book. Let me tell you about my grandmother. <laughs> or I hated your book. Let me tell you all the reasons you're an idiot. It was a stranger. It's, a, it's bizarre behavior. But it's very disconcerting, too. So I get an email from a guy two weeks after the book comes out. The book, by the way, was about American charity. Who gives and who doesn't compared to who thinks they give and who thinks they don't. Right? And, and it had some political stuff and it had some religious stuff in there. And I get an email from a guy two weeks after the book comes out. And it starts like this. Dear Professor Brooks, you are a right-wing fraud. Like, whoa. That's a weak start. <laughs> but I keep reading because I'm a good sport. And I notice that this email is 5,000 words long. It's going to take me 20 minutes to read. Right? But I'm reading through it. And this guy, he turns out that he's going through every single fact and table and equation and data set in the book and refuting every single one. Every chapter. Like, in, in gory detail, like the, you know, the, 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 the columns in table 3.1 are reversed, you moron. Stuff like that, right? <laughs> and I'm going through it, two-thirds of the way through the, through the email, and I realize, here's the thought I'm having constantly. He read my book! <laughs> <laughs> and I was actually filled with gratitude, because look, nobody ever read my stuff before. I'm an academic. Nobody reads that. He read my book. So I thought to myself, you know, what do I got to lose? I'm going to tell them what's written on my heart. So I wrote back to him, dear so-and-so, I know you hated my book and you think I'm a stooge and I'm evil and, and really kind of stupid, but I got to tell you, you know, 
I'm filled with gratitude for you because it took me two years to write that book and you read every word. Thank you. Send. <laughs> and then I went back to work. And 15 minutes later, an email pops up from the guy. Ding. And I'm kind of nervous. Like, what's the next salvo? I open it up. Dear Professor Brooks, next time you're in Dallas, if you want to get some dinner, give me a call. <laughs> what happened? I accidentally turned his contempt into warm-heartedness with my gratitude. I didn't intend to, and that was what I remembered, and that's what I remembered to this day. And here's the point, here's the crazy thing. It's not just that something got a little bit better, I diffused the tough situation. It changed my heart, and I realized, and I especially realized when the Dalai Lama asked me to remember this, that it truly, that acrimonious interactions, that expressions of disdain, that the contempt in our modern society, for you and me as Catholics, that's our opportunity. That's our opportunity to pivot and to change at least one heart, starting with yours. And so what do we need to do? Remember the right reaction and go out looking for it. That's how apostolate works, right? That's how missionary work works, is you go places where the light is not to bring the light. Go out into the wild world of the internet and go fishing for contempt so you can answer it with warm-heartedness, to change your heart, to bring you closer to God, to show more love. <laughs> that was what the Dalai Lama was trying to teach me. It changed my life. It changed my work. I can do controversial things. It's okay. It's okay. Now, these are two new ways of thinking if we're really trying to be in the business of love. There's more. I mean, you have your own ideas, your own examples. But I believe that if we do these things, if we need everybody, we need each other, we need the people that are not thought to be necessary, that project will bring us together. And as we talk about legitimate differences, there's nothing wrong with disagreeing. We need to disagree. That's a form of competition, and competition brings out excellence. The problem is when you shut down competition by making things acrimonious and contemptuous. If we can do that, by getting past contempt to warm-heartedness with each other, we can, be, we can be apostles for that. We have a fighting chance of not just restoring civility, but actually showing love, the love that we need to do as a country. And, and, and maybe, maybe that starts with the John Courtney Murray lecture. One more thing that I'll leave you with this before I invite Father Matt back up so we can talk and hear your thoughts. Um, you know, what I'm asking you to do is not conventional. I'm asking you to do something maybe kind of hard. But as I just mentioned, mission work is always hard. <clears throat> There's a, a retreat center near my home um, in Bethesda. It's called Our Lady of Bethesda. It's run by the Legionaries of Christ. And I teach, my wife and I teach marriage prep there for engaged couples. So I get to go there a lot. My wife prays there every day. And, and the chapel, it's great, it has a sign over the door. But not the door when you're coming in. It's over the door when you're going out. You know what it says? This is for people who are at mats and who are praying to go out to the parking lot. It's the last thing they see. You are now entering mission territory. That's what it says. So, all right. You want to save America? Not America Magazine. This doesn't need saving. <laughs> you want to make the country better. You want to show more love. You want people to see the light of Christ in you. Bet you do. Who would be here if you didn't? So do I. Let's imagine that sign over these doors. Because when we leave tonight, if we take these ideas seriously, you and I, together, no matter how we see the world, we are truly entering mission territory. Doing that together, my friends, maybe love comes back. God bless you. And thank you. something very Jesuitical. Uh, you, you, you changed the premise. Thank you for him. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You changed the premise of the question, or, yeah. or, or question its, its presupposition, and 
Um, it, you're, you're right. That's exactly what John Courtney Murray would do. Um, and so you, you begin in that spirit. I, uh, I, I, I recently had a talk out in St. Louis, and the, the subject the, of the talk was, what are the causes of polarization? And um, I did something similar. I said, actually, that's, that's the wrong question. The, the real question is, who is? And the answer is, you are, and I, right? Together, we are, right? And I unpacked that for a bit. In, uh, and then we had a little question and answer session, and somebody stood up and said, but what about the bishops? Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. but, what about, but what about President Trump? Right? It was a, what is it that stops us, do you think, from, from, uh, from, from, from acknowledging what we have done and what we have built? It's very, very easy to find an external agent for the problems that we have. And, and the reason is because, in point of fact, there are external agents that are worse than any of us. <laughs> but we're not innocent. And, and the, the, the beginning of healing a society comes where we have a locus of control. I can control me. Look, I can't control President Trump. God knows I can't control President Trump. I can't control the bishops. I can't control anybody, but I can't even control my teenage kids. I can control me with God's help. And that's the point. Unless I'm perfect, that's where I have to start looking. It's crazy to look at the places that are, have a bigger problem, but where you have less control. It doesn't actually make sense. I mean, people make this mistake in business all the time. They look at the parts of the business where if this happened, it would really impact our business a lot, so I'm going to pay attention to that. But you can't impact that, so don't look at that. Do what you can do. And Father Matt can affect Father Matt. And Arthur Brooks Sometimes. can affect... Yeah, well, and, and, and again, you know, this is a really interesting thing. There's a wonderful book um, called Why Buddhism is True by Robert Wright, who's a professor of this. He's actually a Buddhist. And he, he talks about the fact that there's an illusion of control that we have over ourselves. And I was reading that, and, and, it's, and it's interesting things. I've looked at all the social psychology and all the brain science on this issue, and it is in point of fact true. There's a great deal of what we think is conscious under our control for a virtuous action that in, in point of fact is wired into our genome. But I don't buy it. I don't buy it because I know that the more I pray and the more I say my rosary and the more I go to mass and the more I try to love my enemy, the better I get. And that is under my control. That is endogenous to my action. And it's under yours too. So the reason that we think about that is because somebody else is worse and it's absolutely true, but that's exactly beside the point. We have to start where we can have the, the only impact where we can have a fighting chance. Yeah, we have to allow ourselves to be scandalized by the grace of God, right? Sure. I mean, because th that's the thing about, uh, uh, there, there are probably a dozen times when you mentioned uh, meditation or prayer, engaging with the Lord in prayer. There, there's no substitute for that, is there? I mean, if you, I, somebody asked me the other day, how would, we've been through a very eventful week at American Magazine with our commentary on American politics. I and, noticed that, uh, yeah, I did notice that. <laughs> I picked up on that. I was just thinking about, I was just saying a prayer for you, Father Matt. You must be having fun of it. Yeah. And somebody said to me, what, how, do you, how do you not respond? You know, because you have this tsunami of tweets coming at you, right? And I said, well, it, if, it, if it was just about me not responding, I couldn't do it. You asked for the grace, right? You could kind of break you down. But then, it also seems to be that in as much as people blame an external agent, they'll also blame the platform, right? They'll say, oh, it, it's social media's fault, right? It's Facebook's fault, it's Twitter's fault. Now maybe, maybe these things are designed in such a way that they play to our baser instincts, but uh, I can say that, you know, somebody said to me, I, uh, it was better in the old days because I would write an angry letter and then I would sit on my kitchen table for 12 hours before I was able to mail it the next day. It gave me time to think about it. <laughs> And I said, but you know what? I still got 300 angry letters. Right? <laughs> so it's not stopping everybody. Right. Right? So it, I mean, how do you think about that problem? I mean, when, when, when people turn and say, well, you know, should we, have we actually done worse by ourselves, by the way, the means by which we're having to help? Yeah, us? so it, indeed. And, and look, I don't want to minimize this. Um, there's a conspiracy. There's a, again, as, you know, as, a, as an economist, I could talk to you about the knock-on effects of desperation, a, a, a culture of despair that has come from the, uh, the asymmetric economic growth in the wake of the Great Recession, yada, yada. I can do all that PhD stuff for you. But there's also truly, there are drug pushers 
in the addiction to contempt. There are people who are making money and getting famous and becoming more and more powerful, and that's fueled by your clicks and eyeballs. So I had to think about it. Look, look, you have a favorite columnist who writes about politics? Why is that your favorite columnist? Because he or she scratches your itch to hear what you want to hear. And that person is actually even a little bit angrier than you are. Look, we all do it. But that person is keeping you addicted to contempt. You need to stop reading that person. That person is manipulating you and getting rich doing it. That's a problem with TV. That's a problem with the paper that I write for. That's a problem with all papers that have op-ed pages. That's a huge problem with social media. And so the first thing that we have to do is declare our independence. We've got to fight back. We have to refuse to be used because we're being manipulated for somebody else's gain. And in so doing, we're becoming the unwitting agents of the culture of contempt that we have to fight back on. I have a book coming out in March called Love Your Enemies. Crazy idea, right? <laughs> and, and basically, the whole beginning of this book talks about the conspiracy to keep us addicted to contempt. It doesn't matter if you're on the right or the left, you've got it. And when people say, when I say, okay, get into your head the agent of your addiction, somebody who's manipulating you, you're wrong because you have in your head somebody you hate on the other side. <laughs> That's manipulating somebody else. That's not manipulating you. It's somebody you really, really like because they say, you know what? You're right. And there isn't that much right. There's a whole lot of disagreement and a whole lot of smoke. And, and, and perhaps your policy ideas do work better than the other side's policy ideas. But if you actually think you're right and somebody else is wrong, you're not thinking hard enough. You're not understanding disagreement well enough, and you're letting yourself be used by these current, current media. Yeah. It, it, it also it, it seems to me that contempt requires certain things, one of which is you clearly have to see other people in a one-dimensional way. Mm -hmm. it, because it's, it's actually quite, it, it, it can be harder, much harder, to have contempt for somebody who uh, you, you know yeah. in three dimensions. Right? It's so true. And there's, a, there's a wonderful study, one of my favorite studies, um, is from a sociologist in uh, Stanford named Richard LaPierre. He wrote a very famous paper in 1934. And his main concern was racial discrimination, particularly against the Chinese. And for, for anybody who's from the West Coast, uh, knows that the early part of the 20th century, there's tremendous legal, overt discrimination against Chinese Americans. I mean, there the, the mayor of Tacoma, uh, Washington, and near where I grew up, he, he rounded up all of the Chinese and sent them on trains down to San Francisco. It's completely legal and the city council approved it. It's just crazy. So this guy Richard Lockyer here at Stanford, he, he runs this experiment where he wanted to know the simple thing. If somebody just hears Chinese, is their reaction different than if they see the person and have to talk to them? Right. So he has this Chinese student who's 21 years old, uh, who's married to a Chinese woman. They're Chinese students, they're nationals, they speak perfect English, but you can't mistake the fact that they're Chinese. And he takes them down to a, a diner that has a big sign in the window saying, no Chinese. And they sit down behind the counter and order a burger and a malt, and they're served by a smiling waitress with no questions asked. So he, then he, he gets a, you know, of course, he does what all academics do, he gets an enormous grant, and he, and he takes them on a 10,000 mile road trip, which by the way, you'd never be able to do now. If I you know, go to you know, the university administration and say, I want to go on a 10,000 mile trip with my graduate student, they'd be like, yeah, no. So the, um, he takes them on a 10,000 mile road trip and they visit 251 car parks, motels, hotels, restaurants, cafes. And he's secretly watching. All of them prohibit the Chinese from using these establishments. And they were, they were denied service once. They were given service 250 times with above average quality service in half the occasions. So then he goes back to his office and he sends out a, a questionnaire to all the establishments saying, would you serve the Chinese? And the answer in 92% of the cases was no. They had. They had served the Chinese. What's the point? In our identity politics culture today, we think that identity is so critically important. Identity of ourselves and of others is one dimensional. This is your point. Right. I am a white man. I am a conservative Catholic, whatever, right? Whatever you happen to be. That's a one-dimensional description of yourself. And if you do it to yourself, you've dehumanized yourself. If you do it to somebody else, you're more likely to discriminate. If you see a name and a face and you have to talk to that person, you will treat that person with greater humanity. The greatest mistake that we're making on college campuses today is identity politics. You belong to a particular group. You have particular rights. You have 
a group that you, that you fit into, that's hugely dehumanizing. That's also the biggest problem that we have in politics. Both sides are, are employing identity politics, and that's one of the great sources of contempt that's, fo that's being fomented and being used by politicians. Don't do it. Telling human stories of your common human experience bonds you to others. Identity defines you as different than other people, and that's a dangerous thing to do. That's one of the greatest deleterious forces in harmony that we can find in America today. <coughs> By the way, we have a uh, we have a microphone, so we'll 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 go to you for your questions and comments. Uh, I'm not sure where it is, but uh, it's somewhere. Oh, it's over here. Okay, yeah, sure. Oh, the mic is standing over there. They don't want you to run off with yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> yes, please don't. Yeah, don't run yeah. off with the mic. The um, but I'll just ask you a question before we go before we do that. The uh, you, <laughs> When we published you on the cover of America Magazine. That must have been fun for you, by the way. There was yeah. some contempt shown. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Not by me. Right. But you know, I got this one letter from a fellow, because you did something quite clever in that piece, uh, perhaps Jesuitical even. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there was a, um, this fellow wrote to me, and he said, I, you know, he said, I'm a, a left-leaning liberal Democrat, and uh, I know Arthur Brooks, and I know his work, and I know AEI, and of course it's history's greatest monster. And, <laughs> But then uh, he said, so I, America arrived, and I opened it, and I said, what is Arthur Brooks doing on the cover of America, right? So he said, but then I started to read it. And he said, and you had mixed your argument for uh, a, you know, a, an appreciation for uh, free markets and a free enterprise with your own narrative, with your own story, right, about your conversion to Catholicism. And, and that ruined it for him. It ruined his contempt. Because he, you know, he, he said to me at the end of the letter, he said, I felt like I had to take this seriously now. I still think he's wrong. <laughs> it just felt like he had to take it seriously. Yeah. Right? Yeah, this, I mean, this, we, we all can do this. I mean, and part of it was when I was writing, I mean, it's a, what a privilege to write for American Magazine. Great magazine. Um, I've read it for years. We all read it. I mean, we all see it. We all take it seriously. The opportunity to write a cover piece for your magazine. I mean, what a, one of the great privileges of my life as a scholar was to be able to do that. And when I was doing it, and anytime I'm writing for anybody, I, I, I have a picture in my mind of the person that I'm writing for, and it's somebody different than me. One of the things that I recommend to our scholars, we have 280 full-time people in the guy, yeah. and I ask them to remember the people that they're fighting for. I mean, the examination of conscience at AEI. We're not, it's not a Catholic organization, but nonetheless, we have an examination of conscience. Many of them don't know that I'm converting them. And uh, <laughs> it, it is to, I say, you know, don't ask if the paper was nice to you, the journalists were nice to you. Ask yourself, did all of my work go for the benefit of people with less power than me? Hmm. If the answer is no, you're messing up. If the answer is yes, take it seriously, get a good night's sleep, come back tomorrow ready to fight. And you know that's the way that you do that is thinking about is having a picture of. I actually ask scholars at AEI to literally have a picture that they cut out and they tape to the bottom of their computer screen of the person they're fighting for. And it better be somebody who's not. It better not be a picture of themselves. That's wrong, right? And so when I was writing for you, I was thinking, who am I writing for? You know, what I'm writing for. I'm writing for people who disagree with me, but are my brothers and sisters. People who think that capitalism is a sham. And that capitalism is really good for rich people or really bad for poor people. And they think this because of their experiences and they think it and they have goodwill and the reason they care about it is because they care about poor people and they want a better life for them. That's what I was writing that piece for. You know, the reason that I came into the free enterprise movement in the first place is because I recognized through the preponderance of evidence as I saw it as I, as I was going through my 20s that we've built two billion people out of poverty of our brothers and sisters since I was a kid. And it's come from things like globalization and free trade and property rights and the rule of law. And, and that stuff's not perfect and we actually need strong government and we need real regulation. But we can maybe get the next two billion, some of them while we sleep. And so therefore, if we think about it right and we work together, left and right, conservatives and liberals, and we think about this is our gift to the world if we make it so. We have a fighting chance of lifting up more people at the margins, which is why God put us on this earth. That's the point that I was trying to make, but I wouldn't have been able to make that case and write it in that way if I didn't have that picture in my mind of your reader, who's not me, right. who's not a conservative guy who runs a think tank, 
It has to be somebody who sees the world differently than me and, and to offer it up and to say, I love you and I want you to hear my point of view. And if you don't like it, that's okay too. Yeah. Well, there, actually, that would, Murray would also say, I think, um, that in order to enter into the public discourse, really in, into any kind of argument, you have to have a certain freedom. Now, he was usually focused on uh, intellectual freedom. Well, what he said amounted to was you have to have the freedom to be wrong. Like you have to have, you have to have the, you have to make yourself vulnerable enough that you could actually be changed yeah. by this encounter because that's what makes it an encounter rather than a confrontation, right? Um, and that's a, but that's a very difficult place to get to, isn't it? Yeah. Particularly when uh, we lose sight of the someone and it's just a something that we're arguing about because it's something you can sort of beat somebody over the head. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's funny. All of us, we do work. Uh, you do and I. We're, we're in the, you and I are in the ideas game. Mm -hmm. You know, so think tanks and media. We're in the, we're trying to, to bring ideas to other people and to change. And ideas have consequences. And ideas change the world. Uh, what What's very helpful for me in the ideas business is to think not about the idea that's going to win the debate, but the moral premise on which ideas are supposed to instantiate. The premises that we're supposed to instantiate with the ideas. For, for, for me, the two moral premises that animate the work that we try to do is that number one proposition is the radical equality of human dignity, and number two is the limitlessness of human potential. Now, my view is that great ways to get that are free enterprise with guardrails and American strength around the world with appropriate limits and policy ideas. But that doesn't impinge on the fact that there are people of goodwill who disagree with me, but really agree with my moral premises. That, that, that human dignity is super equal. I mean, no, no exceptions. And that human potential really is limitless if we can use our genius to that effect. That's the key point. You know, because then, when you're arguing about those things, you can be completely vulnerable to the other side. Because if, you're, if your goal is to get those things, I want to know if I'm wrong first. Right. I don't want to know last. I'm not married to something else. It's, it's changed a lot. I mean, I've changed a lot of the ways that I, I, I often tell you when I'm talking to young people on campuses, I say, don't just try to persuade, try to make yourself persuadable. Because if you do that, then, then you're more likely to find better ways to meet your own objectives. And by the way, to be the, most, the best way to be persuasive is to state the moral objectives of your audience and then say, I have a really good way to get those things. If you notice, that's what I was trying to do tonight. I was trying to say, let's, I think we probably agree about these moral objectives. Here are some ideas that I have on, try, on how to try to get those things. And in so doing, other people will meet you and maybe they'll persuade you. But that's a question of the humility that I think is a virtue that we're supposed to exhibit every day as, as Christians. Yeah, that, and actually, that's another part of Murray's concept of an argument that, and why it's difficult to have. Because you have to have some shared presuppositions. And, um, so what you were trying to get us to see is that we're all sh we all share this value, right? Uh, as Christians, as Americans, and uh, but I have this way of getting to it that's different from perhaps what you yeah. have thought until now, right? And um, you know, when I interviewed John Dixon of uh, CBS News uh, last year, he said that one of the things that he sees is different in contemporary American politics from say. You know, 40 years ago, is this is motive question that you you're, you are questioning the motive of the other? It can't be that you have a different view of how to uh, how to need the poor, right? It's um, it's that you don't care about, them, yeah, right. Um, and but I thought to myself, he's I don't know. I worked in politics once, and uh, there was a lot of motive questioning. Right? But you know what? It wasn't it wasn't permitted. It wasn't socially acceptable to question the motive of the other. It's just like it wasn't, it wasn't acceptable to call your political opponent a liar. Like that was a, that was a place you couldn't go to. You could say he was dishonest in any number of other ways, but you could never say you're a liar, right? So there are certain sort of social conventions, rules, right. protocols that are important for enforcing the public discourse. And if, if we're now in a place where all of those have collapsed, right? Um, even if we do the work that you're suggesting that we that we do, uh, do, do, don't we, in a sense, you know, need those conventions? Yeah, and th here's the good news: it hasn't collapsed. You know, I look at the data: seventy percent of Americans 
still believe in those things. They don't hate their neighbors. They refuse to hate their neighbors, but they're being bullied. And you can get into an environment where a, a minority can manipulate a majority and terrorize a majority and, 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 and use a majority for its own ends. It happens all the time. We're in a social and political disequilibrium in America. And what we need to demand are better leaders. And we have to exhibit the behavior that we want to see. Now, the big reason that we do argument, argumentum ad hominem that you're talking about, the questioning the motives of others, the big reason is anonymity. There's a lot of, a lot of literature on this, but it makes perfect sense. It's, it's, it's common sense for all of you that when you actually don't have to own up to your arguments, you can be a lot more insulting. You can question other people's motives. You can behave in a much, much worse way. That's the reason that Twitter is such a, I mean, you and I are, are public personae on Twitter. I mean, it's like, Father Matt Malone, editor, American Media, America Media, America Magazine, Arthur Brooks, president of the American Enterprise Institute. But a huge percentage of Twitter users are anonymous. And the reason they're anonymous is they want to get away with saying things that they would never say. I mean, it's kind of like New York traffic. You know, people do things inside their cars they would never do outside their cars. You know, I think that the best way to improve traffic in Washington, D.C. is to have a bumper sticker that everybody has to put their name and their house of worship. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey, I just got flipped off by Joe Smith of Our Lady of Sorrows, you know? <laughs> That's weird. No. And, and so right. when we own up to our own identity, we act better. We don't do ad hominem in the same way. We're not insulting in the same way. So, so here's the commitment for all of us. Number one, by the way, I am working with social media companies as, strong, as strenuously as I can to put in place uh, uh, safeguards against anonymity. We should, and, and again, the weirdest thing is this, the, the, the civil liberties guys are, are just apoplectic about this because, you know, well, James Madison, he was anonymous. It's like Twitter is not the Federalist Papers. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. yeah, it is to, is to, is to get, you know, I, I, writing for the New York Times, one of the suggestions that I have that have not listened to me on is we shouldn't have any unsigned comments. But back in the day, I mean, when somebody would write a letter to the editor, right. it would say Joe Smith, Main Street. Right. Right. Now you can be, you know, <coughs> Trump lover 2020, and say any kind of terrible thing, and it's it's so bad. You know, the my publisher Arthur, <coughs> Arthur Sulzberger in the New York Times, he, when I first started writing my column, he said, "Let me give you a piece of advice: never read your comments." And I said, "Why not?" He said, That's "Very good." Advice. He said, "Look, you're a conservative." You could write a column called I Love Puppies and they would denounce you as a fascist. <laughs> and sure enough, but that's because of anonymity. I mean, there's some intrepid souls who would make idiots of themselves in person by, by saying these really, really terrible things. But, but almost all of that is an anonymity question. So number one, let's all work together to get anonymity out of the public square. And number two, let's all commit to actually never being anonymous any place ever. And by the way, you're not anonymous because somebody's watching. And number three, never, 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 never interact with an anonymous source. Never. You know, an anonymous Twitter handle is not a person. Doesn't, it might be a Russian bot, for all you know. Right. Never answer anybody on social media under any circumstances that's not a real person with a check mark. Uh, are there any questions or comments? We have some time. Oh, we have Mike right here. Under the flesh. Perhaps we need to reach some kind of universal agreement. Yeah, no, we got that. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, do I think you need a mic? Yeah. Oh, no, if you yeah, don't, you can. Right down there. Or, we're recording, that's why we need a mic, right? Okay. Yeah. Slightly off topic. Thank you very much. This is great. Thanks. But, um, what's the greatest value you think you can create going forward? Um, thank you for that question. This question, for the, if we're, in case we're recording, is what's the greatest value I can create going forward? You know, that's a discernment question, isn't it, for all of us? Um, I, I'm writing a, a cover piece for the Atlantic Magazine right now on how we all can understand the answer to that question after age 50. Like, are any of you here under 50? It's like, I, you know, I hope you make it. And, uh, and uh, oh. so, uh, um, it's, and, and discernment's a funny thing, you know? It's a, years ago when I was teaching at Syracuse University, and I was very happy, and in, in my prayer, you know, you, as Catholics, we always pray, Lord, make me a better servant, right? And we never mean it, right? I mean, it's just, you just pray it, right? And, and when you mean it, it will be unto you because something's going to happen in your life. So I said, you know, I really want to be a better servant. And I was a professor of Life is Sweet. And, and wheels started turning. You know, the, the bunch of people came and asked if I would run for Congress. 
right? And, and so I went to my wife and I said, honey, they're asking me to run for Congress. What do you think? She said, well, you know, as Catholics, we don't believe in divorce. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the presidency of AEI came open and, and we did, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to become a manager of something. I wanted to continue to write my books and articles and papers. The point is this, discernment is not in my hands. And six months ago or 10 months ago, I started praying that again and I quit my job and I'm leaving AEI, I'm retiring. Um, next June, I'm gonna go teach at Harvard University and I'm gonna start a television show about happiness and bringing people together. And the whole point of my prayer of discernment is, Lord, show me the way to lift people up and bring them together. That's what I want to do for the rest of my life. But I don't know how. So I don't know what the highest and best use is. All I can say is to take Father Malone's great, great uh, advice that you can't do anything unless you're surrounding it, bathing it, soaking it in prayer. Because as far as I'm concerned, you simply can't discern unless you're listening enough. At least that's what I'm thinking about in my life. And, and I, I'd ask you, please, to pray for me. And I'll pray Thank for you, too. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, sir? Hi. Uh, it was terrific. Thank you uh, for the talk. Thanks. Uh, I'm just curious, uh, um, it, it, with respect to your comments about love, uh, something that I've been thinking about for the last few years is the absence of even speaking the, the word love in public discourse, whether it's from public leaders or other civic figures, uh, certainly we hear about it uh, at church, but even amongst uh, you know friends when we're out uh, out to dinner, that that term seems to be somehow uh, lacking. And uh, I, I'm just curious as to your take on on why that's absent. Yeah, thank you for that observation, which I love. Um, <laughs> um, and. You know, I have a, I have this, uh, so some of you may subscribe to my podcast, and uh, I have a podcast that, that it just finished the first season, which was about disagreement, and how to disagree better. By the way, it's called The Arthur Brooks Show, which is a really original title, I think. <laughs> uh, I hired Sachi and Sachi to figure that one out for me. Uh, the second season is about love, because exactly this concern, and he, he, here's what it comes down to. See, your, your observation is totally empirically sound. I was looking at these data, blew, blew my mind. Did you know that, that people in their 20s today are significantly less likely to be in love than people were when they're in their 20s who are my age, or in their 50s now? People are less in love. I mean, the basis of happiness is love. Love, romantic love, I mean, it's, the, it's you know, eros, philia, agape, the whole panoply of Greek love, the way that we understand it, and we have a one word for it, that's the problem in English, but of course, you know, the, 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 the multidimensional approach that you can get in some other languages. Every dimension that you look like, it's in decline. It's crazy, I had no idea, but then I started thinking about it, started digging into the literature, and there's, so the first episode is about the decline of romantic love. Millennials, people in their 20s are, you know, they, they say that they're less like, you heard this big study, millennials getting divorced less than baby boomers. You wanna know why? They're not getting married. It turns out it's hard to get divorced when you don't get married, right? It's like, wow, use of statistics, great job, right? Not to be contemptuous. Anyway, the, um, <laughs> and, so, and, and when I'm looking at it, why is that? Why is that? And there, there are certain reasons that you just can't ignore. Number one is the advent of internet pornography. It destroys relationships between men and women. Second is, is you know, internet dating takes out the transaction cost, the friction of getting to know somebody. It's too efficient. The, the contentious, uh, uh, acrimonious relationship that we, that more and more between men and women. You know, universities will have 50 or 60 Title IX officers to adjudicate the dating world. And I understand because, you know, predation and exploitation, I understand the problems. But when we, we basically set the, the genders, the sexes up as, as enemies of each other, that one is an exploiter and the other is, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to have an impact. And I'm thinking about it, you know, give the devil his due. He's very good at his job. He makes people on their own. It, create institutions where they love each other less. Why do we talk less about love? Because we have less love. The same thing is true when we see a, a major movement in the United States. Uh, you know, we, we see all this, you know, the work on, on, on religious sociology about the nuns, not N-U-N-S. That would be great if we had more of them. N-O-N-E-S, people who say they have no religion, right? What's on the rise? People who say they're spiritual but not religious. I got the data, they're neither. You know, the truth of the matter is we need institutions that bring us, that, that help us to instantiate, to institutionalize our love for the Lord. 
and that's in decline as well. Take away your love for your partner, for your spouse. Take away the love for the Lord. You know, the fact is that friendships are in decline. The loneliest people in America today are 60-year-old men. <laughs> it's funny. The, it's not funny. It's sad, but it's, uh, it's um, strangely, you know, mirthlessly amusing. Nonetheless, that 60% of 60-year-old men say their best friend is their wife, and 30% of their wives say their best friend is their husband. <laughs> that's the story of unrequited friendship. You know, that's in decline. The reason you hear it less is because there's less of it. So that's a battle. That's a battle against the darkness that we need to bring back. Light is love. That's what we're taught. God is love. And so how are you going to get it back? Ask yourself, and I'm asking myself. We've got to ask ourselves, and I, I, I would love your suggestions. How can I be an agent for great love? To begin with, I'm going to show it. I don't care where I'm going. I'm going to show it. I'm, going to, I'm not getting out of here tonight without you thinking I don't love you, for sure. But what else can I do with my friends? What else can I do with my kids? What else can I do with my employees? I have 280 employees. What can I do? It's funny. I started thinking about this, and I was giving this State of the Institute talk. You know, once a year, I get the whole company together. And I thought, and I said at the end, I just love you so much. And people were like, whoa, what's going to drinking? <laughs> you know? But it's true. I love them. Tell them. Tell them more. Thank you. I told my staff at the end of the staff meeting once that I loved them, and, I, and I, they were shocked, I think. Yeah, because it's, I mean, because it's not always the way that we talk in the workplace. I mean, maybe at a ministry like ours, it's, it would be more expected, but still. At AEI, that was super weird, man. Yeah. It's like, nobody brought me up on charges yet, or anything, but, yeah. but the thing is also, it's, it's, it's funny, you know, the, the, the pastor of my parish, from the pulpit, the first time I'd ever heard this, the priest said, I love you to the congregation. Yeah. And it sounded so weird. Why is that weird? We got priests here. What if you say that? What if you say that more? All of you are leaders. You're in positions of authority. You do, you do love people. We're afraid to say it because people feel less and it becomes more foreign. Let me tell you, any country in Europe that would be even weirder. I mean, I, I lived in Spain for a long time. If you're in Spain and, and os quiero, it's like, what? that person's insane. Yeah. It would be even stranger in the United States. This is a, this is a, you know what this is? You just started a movement. <laughs> Let's make this into a movement. Let's be part of this movement together. Yes, sir. Yes. At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the dignity of work for, for individuals. I, I agree with that. But I see two issues in our modern world. Uh, I personally know about seven people who are on disability, don't work, they don't have anything physically wrong with them, they have mental illness, and I don't know where you see them in the work world or not. And then the other issue is um, artificial intelligence and mechanization. You go to, one goes to CVS and there, oh, there's one clerk and then a whole bunch of yeah. self-checkouts. You know, there'll be self-driving trucks soon. And even intellectual work, accounting, a lot of that is going to be automated, engineering, <coughs> Where do you see, and uh, free enterprise is just going to uh, uh, promote that. That's, mm -hmm. So where do you see um, the dignity of work in the next uh, 30 years with these two issues? Thank you. Thank you for that. That's a, that's a very beautiful and very Catholic question, and I appreciate it a lot. Um, you know, it's, well, first we'll talk about people on disability. One of the, we all have disabilities. I mean, we're all disabled. Not just because we're fallen, we all have problems. We all have things that make us less effective than we could be. And yet, we're, most of us are able to create enough value in the marketplace because to, to merit a job that's not given to us, that we earn. And the reason is because we, we have skills to do so despite our failings, despite our disabilities. That's the formula. You know, we've been horrible at seeing people with very traditional disabilities as liabilities. We're terrible about that. They're not, they're assets in the human family. Everybody deserves more skill. I mean, the whole, it's, a, it's an enormous public good. Now, I do a lot of work on criminal justice reform. So, you know, one of the, the, the group that's most marginalized in America today is not the disabled, not even the mentally ill, it's the formerly incarcerated. There are 23 million Americans walking around who've been in prison. They have a 70% unemployment rate and a 50% reincarceration rate within 24 months. It's a complete scandal. It's a total disaster. 
for America. And the reason that we have this problem is because we treat them like liabilities to manage as opposed to assets. 600,000 people are gonna come out of prison this year. We need their ore in the water. This country really, really needs them to work. And we have a lack of, and it's not just a lack of courage, it's a lack of imagination. You know, I look, I've been involved in a lot of programs that's prison to work. And, and by the way, I've seen many programs that tries to train the disabled toward real skills, and they're successful. You know, we just need to do this, dedicate ourselves to it. This is not charity, this is just smart. <laughs> we can't leave these resources lying around. We can't leave dead capital lying around. This is our future that we're talking about. It's not smart, I will tell you as an economist, and it's not good, I'll tell you as a Catholic. Now the second question that you, what's your, your second question? Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Okay, so, so, so we get this a lot. You know, we get this question a lot. It occurs to all of us a lot. We cannot hold back this tide. That's like standing at the beach, trying to hold back the ocean with your hands. It's just not, there's nothing that we can do. We can only try to meet the challenge and turn it into an opportunity. So how do we do that? Now to begin with, let's take the truck driving. Everybody talks about truck, all the trucks are gonna be self-driving or something, maybe. But there are three million professional driving jobs in America today. There are seven million unfilled jobs in America today. There's tw more than twice as many jobs that are unfilled. Most of them are blue collar. Most of them are semi-skilled. The reason that we have a problem with unemployment in this country is because of a skills needs mismatch. We're not giving people the skills that they need and encouraging them to go where the jobs are. We're lazy, we're treating poor people like liabilities that will park on Section 8 housing and Medicaid and food stamps, and that takes away their dignity. If we believe in the dignity of our work, if we believe in the sanctification of our work, then we believe in the dignity of their work and the sanctification of their work. And so what we need to do is to work harder in public policy and to insist as citizens that we stop treating people like liabilities just because they're at the margins of our economy and start making sure that people have skills. Number one thing I'll say about that before I stop on this, on this particular topic, what it, it's a real bugaboo for me, is this elitist college for all mentality that we have in this country. 32% of Americans finish college. 32% of Americans have a bachelor's degree. I mean, I mean think about the idea that we've got 68% of Americans who don't have this college degree, and yet we say that Anybody can go to college. Anybody can do it. We set up a caste system in this country where if you don't go to college, you're somehow worth less. We don't need college to the extent that we have it. About 50% of people with a college degree don't use their college degree in any of their work. We need more skills for more people. And we need a culture that's not saying that you're less as a person, that you have less moral or, or social worth if you don't have a, a college degree. It's funny, you know, it's, it, my kids, my, my boys, they went to a school in Potomac, Maryland called the Heights. And it's a, it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful Catholic school, preparatory school. And, and you know, my wife, who, who graduated from high school when she was 29 and didn't go to college, um, and you know, she's on the board. And she would say, we need solutions for guys who don't go to college. And, the, and they, the, the guidance counselor would say, yeah, but nobody wants to be the parent who hears your son's not college material. Nobody wants to hear that, right? And, and then the day came when the guidance counselor suggested that maybe one of my sons not go to college. And it felt rotten, man. It felt terrible. But, so what do we do? He's a wheat farmer in Idaho now. He's driving a $500,000 combine. He's got skills and he's happy. That is success. But he, not everybody's got a Rolodex like mine. Not everybody's got the relationships like I have. What the heck is going on in this country where we can't match people with the skills that meet their passions? Maybe, maybe he'll go to college at some point. Maybe he won't. He's going to be fine. But think of all the kids who won't, who grow up in the, at the margins in little towns where there's no jobs or who, who, work, who live in ghettos of cities. And they don't have a dad who can call up somebody who can say, can, can you train my son to be a farmer? <laughs> that's what we need to do. That's what, that's what we have to put our shoulder to the wheel as Americans and as Catholics. Well, uh, speaking of places west of the Hudson, um, I, every year I go out to the Aspen Ideas Festival, sponsored by the Aspen Institute in Aspen, Colorado, and I usually stay with the chair of our board, uh, Mrs. Susan Braddock and her family. And, uh, and, and Susan always has a very clear idea of who I'm going to meet and who I'm going to listen to. 
Uh, after we've been to Mass at the monastery at 7 a.m., which I haven't done since I was a novice. <laughs> um, she said, we're going to go to Mass at the monastery, and then we're going to go to this uh, party in the afternoon. We're going to hear uh, uh, Arthur Brooks speak from the American Enterprise Institute. That was about three years ago. And uh, I entered into this beautiful home among a punk bunch of truly wonderful people who probably uh, uh, never voted for a Democrat or, uh, <laughs> and are probably, uh, you know, uh, not all Catholics. And uh, there is Arthur standing with the mountains behind him, uh, quoting Pope Francis, talking about the opioid addiction and how we have to actually not have contempt for people who disagree with us. And I turned to Susan. I said, we have to get that man in the pages of America. And she said, well, ask him. So I came home. I sent you an email. Within 10 minutes, you replied and said, I'll do it. Yeah. I thank you for that. I thank you for tonight. Thank you. Guys.